Hi everyone, this is our channel, Meet the Real Story. Please, like, share and subscribe. A Vindictive Ghost Love is the biggest treasure in my life. Good memories, exciting adventures, happiness, sadness, dreams. All these matter and help people endure suffering in their lives. My name is Alex. I'm 18 years old and currently in the 12th grade. I used to live in a small remote village with my parents. I was their only child. My parents raised me well, educated me, and taught me good manners. I see the fruits of their labor in me in every difficult situation I face. For example, after I was murdered, I knew exactly what to do. Intrigued? Are you eager to hear my story? Let's go. When my father received a promotion, we moved from our small village to the big city. I had many nice memories of that little remote village. I had many friends there that I used to play, joke, and laugh with. I feel like I left half of my soul in that village. My father bought us a nice home in a quiet neighborhood. I liked the place the moment we arrived. Our neighbors were nice, and they offered to help us move in. I liked them all. I felt that I would make many new friends in my new neighborhood. One day, I went to the supermarket to buy some necessities for my mum, when suddenly, I bumped into a girl named Rachel. We were coincidentally buying the same item, and there was only one left. I got to it first, but seeing that she wanted it also, like a true gentleman, I offered it to her instead. Initially, she politely declined, but then she gladly accepted my kind gesture in the end. I ended up walking her home and discovered that she was my neighbor. I fell in love with her at first sight. Once we arrived at her home, we said goodbye and she said she would see me tomorrow. I wanted time to pass quickly so I could see her again. As I was walking to school the next day, I met her along the way and we walked together. I was overjoyed. After arriving at school, she introduced me to her friends and then I went to my class. The teacher's aide welcomed me and directed me to my class. When I entered the class, I was surprised to see Rachel there. She was in my class. I entered the class and sat in a desk on the last row. During a class break, Rachel was sitting with her friends. When she saw me sitting alone, she left her friends and came over and sat with me. Suddenly, a boy named Mario, older than us, entered the class with a group of his cohorts. They looked like a gang of thugs to me. He said to me, Hey you, if you want to live, you'd best stay away from Rachel. Rachel seemed afraid and was visibly shaking at this point. I told him, if you're trying to pick a fight, creep, I'm ready. He grabbed me by my collar and threw me onto a desk, then turned around and quickly left. Rachel explained, he wants to date me, but it'll only happen in his dreams. Rachel and I spent a lot of time together at school, but we weren't safe from Mario's bullying. One day, we decided to go to a rocky hillside to sit beside the river and watch the sunset. I got our bikes ready and off we went down the road, laughing and talking. I had decided before this trip that I would tell her about my love for her. I chose this trip to tell her because it seemed like it would be an unforgettable moment and it really was. After we arrived I looked into her eyes, kneeled down on my knees, and gave her a present. Then I said, I love you Rachel. She was surprised to say the least and put her hand over her mouth. Then I suddenly heard a camera flash and a voice say, cut, let's repeat this scene again. I looked around to see Mario and his gang. One of them was holding a camera. I shouted angrily, What are you doing here? If you want to fight, I'm ready, but leave Rachel alone. I heard Rachel laughing, and it sent a chill down my spine, for she wasn't laughing in a joyful manner, but in a mocking one. Then she began clapping her hands and said, You are really brave, Alex, but you are also an idiot. I froze. I couldn't believe my eyes when Rachel walked over and stood beside Mario, smiling. Mario said, if you had asked around, you would have known that Rachel and I always welcome new students this way. You're our sucker of the week. I spat out, you're all pigs. I punched him in the face and he counterpunched me in the stomach. He said, do you realize how stupid you are? I spit in his face and he became enraged and pulled me towards him by my collar. Rachel tried to stop him. He threw me into the river. The last thing I remember as my head went under the water was Mario's derisive, self-satisfied laughter. When I woke up, I was lying on a wooden bed with an old man sitting beside me. 
He told me that I had been unconscious for four days. I asked him where I was and how I had gotten there. He told me that he found me unconscious floating in the river and that he had rescued me, saved me from drowning. I thought, oh my god, my parents must be so worried about me. I tried to get up and felt an excruciating pain that stopped me. I saw that my leg was broken and that the stranger had bandaged it as best he could. I asked him to call my family. He said he had no telephone, but he offered to visit my family and tell them what had happened and that I was okay. I told him that I would be so grateful if he could do so. I accepted his offer and thanked him. He returned with a newspaper in his hand and had a sad look on his face. I read the paper which said that I was presumed dead, having drowned in the river because they couldn't find my body. I was angry at Rachel and Mario, and also worried for my parents at the same time. I asked the man to please take me home. Then I crept into my home to see my parents sleeping. They were holding a photo of me and looked sad. I didn't wake them, but rather snuck over to Rachel's house. She was speaking on the phone, so I eavesdropped. She was saying, I didn't expect this to happen, but it's all good. Maybe he's in a better place now. What an idiot and a fool he was. Then she laughed. I was pretty upset to hear her mocking laughter without any regret whatsoever of being involved in causing my death. I returned home and encountered my father in the bathroom. When he saw me, he was initially startled and incredulous. But then I hugged him, and he began crying tears of joy. Then mother woke up and I hugged her too. They asked me what had happened and I told them everything, but I asked them not to reveal that I wasn't dead yet. They asked me why, and I told them I would explain later. I decided to exact some sweet revenge on my would-be murderers. That night, I tacked a letter on Rachel's front door. The next day she found it and read it. The scribbly handwriting said simply, I'm coming for you. It was signed, Alex's Ghost. After reading it, she immediately looked around to see if anyone was nearby who might have delivered the letter, but there was no one in sight. I sent this same letter to Mario and to each of his gang members too. I sent these letters on a daily basis for several days. Then one day, I took my scheme to the next step. I sent a letter to Mario with Rachel's forged signature and a letter to Rachel with Mario's forged signature. The letters told them to meet each other at the same site where they had killed me. I was hiding in the trees when they arrived. Rachel asked Mario, why did you want to meet me here? He replied, me? You asked me to meet you here. Rachel denied that she had done any such thing. Suddenly, I walked slowly out from the trees and said, I am the vindictive spirit of Alex's soul, and I have come to take my revenge on you two murderers. Suddenly frightened, they got down on their knees and pleaded with me to forgive them, and they said, We threw you in the river, but we didn't mean to kill you. It was an accident. Then a police car siren sounded, and a police car's blue lights began flashing, and several policemen came out from hiding in the trees. Having heard Mario and Rachel's confession, the police took them into custody. As Mario and Rachel were being escorted away, I said to them, Now who's stupid, idiot? I have drank and I've used drugs, but I've never suffered from withdrawals. I've never chosen drugs or alcohol over my loved ones. And I have never stolen anything in order to score. I'm not an addict, but I love one. And sometimes, that's an addiction. Like so many other teens and young adults, I experimented with my fair share of recreational drugs and alcohol in high school. So when my younger sister started doing the same thing when she was 14, I wrote off her new habits as reckless, youthful behavior. She would grow out of this phase eventually, I thought, just like I did. But instead of getting worried with the lifestyle and moving on, she craved more of it. And by the time she was 19, the party drugs she was using were not even enough for her. And that's when she found heroin. One of the first things that gave away her addiction was her eyes. Usually big and blue and full of light. They became dark and dodgy orbs that could never quite focus. Never look you back. Never hold your gaze. The look I had once found in them was long gone, and I felt uneasy whenever our eyes met. 
which as she began to use more became less and less frequent. As drugs became a bigger part of her life, everything else became smaller, even me. The days of us driving around our small town in my car, smoking a ball and blasting sublime, were replaced with quick visits to her darkened bedroom, a space that I had left her in after I went off to college, which had transformed from a teenage safe heaven into a dark cave filled with cigarette smoke, empty booze bottles, and stash boxes of every kind of opiate you could imagine including heroin, oxycodone, and opium. The evidence was right in front of me, but sometimes it's easier to ignore the obvious than it is to embrace the uncomfortable. When we went out, which was rare because it was nearly impossible to get my sister away from the comfort cave she had built for herself, I wrote off her frequent visits to the bathroom and lack of appetite as stomach problems or even body issues. When she didn't laugh at our favorite comedy sketches, I told myself that maybe she'd just seen it too many times for it to be funny anymore. When she stayed up until 4 a.m. in the morning and slept until 3 p.m., and when she started wearing long, clothed in 90 degree weather, when she couldn't hold a job, when she got her hands on money she couldn't explain, and when I actually found her stash in her purse when I was snooping one day, I just kept telling myself, she's young, she's rebelling, she'll move past this phase. I was 24 and living in Brooklyn when my 21 year old sister called me and admitted it. Plainly and almost optimistically, she was an addict. I think you already know this, she said, voice shaky and a little too loud. But I have a drug problem. Her confession gave me no choice but to admit it too. And suddenly, my entire world had changed. The lying, the stealing, the cheating... The messy parts of an addict's life don't really change from one user to the next. They're just as dark, just as sad, and just as unforgivable as you would imagine they would be. And they're not worth the reliving and writing because I relive them every day in my own mind. Loving a drug addict is all-consuming and inescapable. It's on your mind all the time. You become a husk of a human whose insides have been entirely replaced by anger, fear, and resentment, and suddenly those feelings start to bubble over into every part of your life. The little voices in your head start to tell you to be suspicious of everyone in your life. Because if this one person could betray you, if your loved one could steal from you, if your own little sister could stare you straight in the eyes and swear up and down they haven't used, when you know damn well they're hiding the drugs in their bra, then who can you trust? Your constant suspicion makes you angry too. Angry at your loved one for getting addicted in the first place. Furious at the family who sat back and watched it happen and bitter with the entire world for allowing a problem like this to exist. But it's the guilt that hurts me most of all, because I have taken her addiction and made it my own. Because of the darkest question in my mind isn't about whether or not my sister will live to her 